Okay, so since we're in a class on program evaluation, um, it, it would be helpful to define what a program is and what all the components of a program are. Um, so what we're going to do first is talk about the four key elements of a program and what, ma what makes up a social program. Um, so the first two elements that we want to talk about are inputs and activities. So inputs are things that go into a program. Um, it's the money that you spend on something. It's the employees that work on the program. And so if you think of a program like um, food stamps or SNAP, um, there's a whole bunch of different inputs into SNAP. Um, there are the social workers who process applications. There are, there's congressional funding. There's state funding. Um, there are the, the actual papers, the applications that people submit. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things that all kind of flow into this program. Um, that is designed to do other stuff down the line. So inputs are the things that kind of feed into the program, the actual um, inputs, hence the name. Um, things that go into some sort of activity. An activity is something that takes inputs and changes it into something. Um, so in the case of food stamps, for instance, or SNAP, um, people apply um, and so the input is the time that people spend applying. It is the actual application that goes in. Um, the employee who works on it is an input. The activity is processing the application. Um, and then that activity creates something called an output. So an output up here is the actual tangible good or services or service that is produced by the activity. And so it, in this case, it is adding somebody to food stamps and getting them um, an EBT card that lets them spend money in a grocery store. Um, and so that is the output. And so you're taking money and time and people doing something and then converting that into some sort of output, um, some sort of tangible something that you can measure. Um, and so that is kind of the process. Like Essentially, activities are like little factories that take inputs, turn them into outputs. Um, the last part of a program, though, is this outcome idea. And this is the trickiest part um, because it's less tangible and it's less measurable. If you are in charge of administering food stamps, you can measure the amount of time people are spending um, on applications. You can measure the number of employees you have. You can look at the activities. You can see the, the processing time. You can see congressional debates. You can see kind of all of the different activities. You can measure outputs. You can see how much people are spending on food. You can see how many EBT cards are getting shipped out to people. All of that stuff is measurable. But the outcomes, the whole purpose of this food stamps program is to reduce poverty, is to alleviate hunger. Um, that is a far more distant outcome. Um, you're hoping that the outputs that you generate, these tangible goods and services, lead to the outcome. Um, but you can't measure this directly. Um, you can't like, you can kind of measure like poverty um, has some sort of abstract way of measuring poverty in, in the United States. Um, but that is not directly related to people using food stamps. Um, so it's really hard to, to trace that. But this is the general process that you go through. Um, you start with inputs. Those go into some sort of activity. That activity spits out some outputs. And then down the line, you hope that those outputs turn into outcomes and cause the outcomes. Um, and this is the trickiest part right here, measuring the connection between outputs and outcomes where you're hoping that this program, the inputs, activities, outputs, you're hoping that the thing that you actually set up and that you're managing and that you're overseeing and measuring leads to some more distant, faraway outcome. Um, and that is the whole focus of this class, is measuring this arrow, basically. Um, we want to see, does this stuff, inputs, activities, outputs, lead to some social change? Um, some improvement in society, some something far in the distance that we hope happens because of the program. Um, and in order to make sure that works, it is generally best to have some sort of theory behind your program so that you know if we're trying to, like, I have a theory of poverty, that people um, suffer from poverty. And so if we can alleviate some of that suffering by providing food, for instance, that will help improve outcomes and help alleviate poverty and help reduce poverty. And so the theory there behind SNAP benefits or food stamps is to um, 
use um, payments for food to reduce poverty. And that is the, the theory behind it. Um, so in general, a program theory is an explanation or some um, hypothesis of how and why an intervention, meaning the inputs, activities, outputs, will cause some sort of change in outcomes. Um, so it's essentially a sequence of events that connects all of these things together. It's making sure all of those arrows are leading to the outcome. Um, or basically why you think the inputs that you're getting into your program, the activities that happen, the outputs, all three of those things, why you think those will lead to whatever social outcome you care about. Um, and so that is the whole goal of, uh, of figuring out a program theory here, is to be able to guess um, at any social changes, hypothesize the social changes that you'll see. Um, so another way of thinking about this is this idea of an impact theory, where you can actually graph this out. This is different from a causal diagram. Um, we've been talking about DAGs in the very first session, the directed acyclic graphs. Um, those are different than what we're going to be talking about today with impact theories and logic models. And we'll talk about why once we get to the DAG section. Um, so with impact theories, it's mostly a way of explicitly showing or explicitly mapping out how your activities or your program in general leads to the outcomes you care about. So that's mostly the focus here is the activities leading to the outcomes. So an example of this is this graph right here. Um, so this is from a program evaluation I did as an MPA student a few years ago um, for a school district in Utah that had implemented a truancy court system um, to help students avoid the juvenile um, justice system. For whatever reason in Utah, if you are a teenager and you skip school a certain number of times, um, then you can be sent to the criminal justice system. And then you're in the juvenile detention system and then that eventually transfers to adult detention. And so what the school district wanted to do was eliminate um, kind of that, that school to prison pipeline based on attendance. And so they created a truancy court system that was kind of outside of the regular legal system, but it was a way of, of intervening and making sure that students who were truant or who were absent had a way to kind of get back on track without going to the legal system. And so they had this whole program set up to intervene um, to help kids not go through um, the regular legal system. And so that's what this blue section here is. It's all of the inputs, activities, and outputs. It's the whole um, truancy intervention program. And what the designers of this program wanted, to, or what they thought, what they theorized, was that by doing this program, it would lead to these outcomes. It would reduce truancy. That was kind of a, a closer outcome. Um, that is kind of easier to measure. Um, by reducing truancy, they hoped that that would then increase students' commitments to school and um, improve their grades, um, which is kind of easier to measure. You can, you can measure grades. Measuring commitment to school, that's harder to measure. Um, and then ultimately what they're hoping is that by increasing commitment to school and improving grades, the, the risk factors for um, criminal activity and criminal behavior in the future will be reduced and disappear. Um, and so their theory is that their program causes reduced risk factors by going through these other outcomes here. Um, and so that was their idea behind implementing this program. And it was explicitly written out, not in this form exactly, but they did have a, a proposal for their program that said, based on academic research we've seen, this is the best way to um, reduce risk factors through education is by making sure kids are in school. And so we developed this whole program to reduce truancy so that they can go to school so that they can reduce risk factors. So it was clearly articulated why they thought this would work. And so they had kind of an impact theory. That is not always the case. And even if it is the case, sometimes the links between um, the program and the outcome don't always make sense. Um, so for instance, in 2005-ish, um, in the early 2000s, there was this idea um, in the MIT, Harvard world, and in Silicon Valley that we could improve or we could reduce poverty around the world and improve access to technology by providing laptops to all children in the, in the developing world. So there was a project called the One Laptop Per Child Project, or OLPC, 
Um, it was led by a guy named Nicholas Negroponte, um, who was an MIT professor. Um, and his whole idea was if we developed really, really cheap laptops that ran on not electricity, um, but other forms of power, then we could give the whole developing world access to the internet and access to technology. And so their goal was to develop a laptop that only cost $100, and then donors could buy laptops for kids in the developing world, and they could donate $100, get a laptop. And so this is the $100 laptop that they invented here. Um, it, it's cute looking. It has a mini keyboard here. This is from 2005. This is before iPads were a thing. This is before iPhones were a thing. Um, it had Wi-Fi. One of these antenna things is Wi-Fi. Um, it was char it has a battery and you charge the battery by rotating um, this arm right here, which you could kind of like grind it around in circles and it would charge the battery and then you wouldn't have to plug it in. Um, and so that was the whole idea of this. You could use it in a village somewhere that was super remote and um, use a computer and program stuff. Um, and so their whole idea behind this, they had an explicit impact theory, basically. So what they wanted to do, or what they thought, was that if they could improve access to computers, that would then give kids 21st century technology skills. So that was their whole idea. They wanted that to happen. And that was their theory, is that by getting access to a computer, getting access to the OLTC computer that was only $100, that you could train kids in 21st technology skills, which would then give kids access to the global marketplace. And so kids in remote villages could teach themselves how to program, and then they could go work for Google and get rich. So a global marketplace. And because they could access the global marketplace, um, then poverty would go down. And so that was their solution to poverty, who were one of their prongs of, of fixing poverty there. So even if you have a what looks like a well thought out theory with different nodes and different arrows pointing to from your program to the different outcomes that you're hoping to get. Um, all of those things have to actually work in real life and be, be practical and be rooted in reality. And one of the issues that the One Laptop Per Child program faced is that this didn't actually happen. Um, the cheapest they could ever get the laptop was $180. Um, they couldn't ever get it down to 100 and they had to strip down a whole bunch of the functionality. It wasn't able to connect to the internet like they had hoped. Um, they couldn't include lots of the programming languages on there that they had hoped. Um, it didn't work very well on the ground. Um, it was very fragile. Um, and so the UN actually partnered with the OLPC uh, project and uh, they held a press conference in 2005 um, with Nicholas Negroponte here. He's the, the creator of the, of the project. Um, he held a press conference with Kofi Annan, who was the Secretary General of the UN at the time. And near the end of their press conference, um, Kofi Annan, he asked Kofi Annan to, to try out the, the rotating thing to see how it charges. And this is what ended up happening here. So they picked up the computer. And so the Secretary General starts spinning the thing to charge it. And if you watch the handle, it snaps off. So they switch to a different machine and start spinning that. And then it snaps off too. And then the whole press conference kind of gets derailed. And it was like super embarrassing. Um, the, uh, that wasn't the only issue. The whole computer itself, because they had to make it super cheap or as cheap as possible, kept falling apart. And the designers of the laptop didn't think about kind of on the ground conditions or the fact that kids drop stuff. And so tons of these laptops would get dropped on the ground and shatter. Um, they had all sorts of issues with broken laptops. Um, and so in the end, um, the project kind of just um, fell apart and didn't work very well. They had utopian expectations um, of how well this thing would work, but um, it didn't actually reflect the realities on the ground. It didn't take local conditions into account. And so as a result, um, it didn't really work that well. So if we go back to the impact theory picture here, the idea was that giving access to computers would lead to these skills. But 
everything kind of fell apart at that point right there. They couldn't get access to high technology computers to villages. Um, these kids were not able to learn Python or other fancy programming languages so they could then go work for Google or create apps. Um, apps weren't a thing in 2005. There was no iPhone, there was no Android. Um, it was really hard to get kids on the internet. And so what ended up happening is this link right here, that arrow, was very, very tenuous. The theory was that doing really cool computer stuff would lead to all of these outcomes, but the, the theory fell apart right here because the implementation didn't work. And even if it had worked, I don't know if 10-year-olds in some village in Kenya would be able to suddenly join Google um, because they were working on Python in their village. Like that's, that's a big leap um, to make in this theory, which then kind of breaks the rest of the chain here and you're not necessarily going to fix poverty with this hundred dollar laptop um, and so it didn't really work that well because the impact theory wasn't necessarily sound um, lots of other projects and programs go through similar processes um, so there was this this idea here this idea of the play pump which was a merry-go-round that some mechanical engineers in the united states um, invented that was create that was designed to pull water from the ground so that you could then pump it up into a water tower and store water in there and then the rest of the village could use the water so it was kind of a, a faster way of, of getting at water instead of digging a deep well and having kids spend all their time pulling water out of the well and marching it into the village they could spin around on the merry-go-round and that would bring water um, to the to their village so the impact theory that they had for this went something like this. Um, they thought improved access to water would lead to better health and better education and poverty would go away. Okay, so that seems like a fairly sound impact theory, like um, having water will help all of these outcomes for sure. Um, the issue, though, is again, linking this program here to the outcomes. The program looks neat. It has this merry-go-round that kids can spin on, and it would pull water up from the ground, and then suddenly they have access to running water in the village, and everything is great. Um, and so we like that. But the problem is in the actual implementation of this merry-go-round system, um, it didn't actually um, work very well. So it's not necessarily improved access to water. The impact theory really is merry-go-round leads to improved access to water, which then leads to these other things. Um, this is where everything fell apart. So what ended up happening with this project, or this whole program here, is um, the only way it works is if kids are out playing on it every single day. And so it led to um, all sorts of kind of overuse, like villages would have um, rotation systems and they would have groups of kids play on it so they could guarantee it was moving all at all times. Um, a study by some uh, investigative journalists at the time in 2009 um, calculated that children would have to play on the merry-go-round for 27 hours a day in order to pump enough water to get to villages. But there's only 24 hours in a day. And even if you're forcing kids to play for 24 hours a day, that's like unethical. You have to have like a, a crew of kids running or spinning around on it from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Um, that's nuts. And so there wasn't enough power to get everything, um, that, to get all the water out that they needed. Um, it also only works in locations that have good sources of water, that have a high water table, um, because it's just the nature of this thing. It's, it doesn't dig really, really deep into the ground. And so they could only install this in places where it was easy to dig a well. And in general, it's more efficient to just dig a well or install an electrical pump or a gas pump or some other sort of pump that is not powered by human kids. Um, and so in places where they needed it, where the water table is really low, this doesn't work. And so it was solving a problem that wasn't necessarily a problem. Um, and so as a result, the program just kind of folded and it doesn't exist anymore, um, which um, was kind of sad, but it was lots of lots of money kind of pumped into this thing to ultimately not work. 
but it ultimately didn't work because the the link between the activity the pump itself the merry-go-round pump and all of the, the pie in the sky outcomes that they were hoping to get that was really tenuous and not tested and they were just hoping it would work and it didn't um, and so this is generally why we want to theorize about programs. We want to have some sort of connection between the program that we're doing and what we're hoping will be the outcomes. Um, all programs implicitly have some sort of theory. Nobody's going to invent some sort of cool social program unless they're hoping it's going to do something down the line. Um, every sort of every program out there has some sort of theory behind it of like how this is going to improve society. Um, even if it's a ludicrous theory, it's still like a $100 laptop will create Google engineers. It's weird, but there's still a theory there. Um, so you have implicit theories. You can also have articulated theories, which is just a written down, sometimes studied um, version of the implicit theory, um, where often you'll see a program justify itself and say, we exist, we're trying to do this thing because of all of these other studies that say this is the connection between these types of activities and these types of outcomes. Um, so having an articulated theory isn't super common, um, but it's, it's kind of good practice to have that. So if you're inventing your own um, program in your current workplace, or if you have an idea of how to fix society and you have a cool I idea of a program, try to articulate that theory and write it down somewhere and say, this is what I think is going to happen because of these reasons in academic research or in policy research in general. And then try to map out the connections between your activities or your program in general and the outcomes that you hope to have happen. Um, it leads us to this interesting question here. Should all social programs be rooted in explicit articulated theory? And the answer to this is no. Um, sometimes you think of an idea and you hope that it will work and you don't necessarily have the time to do a really long peer reviewed study to see if the theory is true or anything like that. You're just gonna try something and see if it sticks. Um, for your final project, you're all going to be choosing different programs. Some of the programs will have an articulated theory. If you go to um, some nonprofit that is running some sort of special program that like one of their one of their programs that they offer, they might have on their website a paragraph that says we are doing this program because we think that by doing X, these different outcomes will happen. And that's really cool if that's the case. Um, that's awesome. Most programs, though, won't actually say that. They'll just say, here's our program. Um, here's our intended outcomes. And they don't explain that link between them. You just have to guess at it. And so that's the implicit theory world. But it's this isn't necessarily bad. This is just that they haven't taken the time to write everything down and study it carefully. And that comes with practice and that comes with more experience. So a good example of this is um, this nonprofit here. Um, I was on their board for a few years. Um, they're called Lifting Hands International. Um, they work with refugees all around the world. Um, they're based in Arizona. Um, and they do a whole bunch of different programs. They collect um, shipments of, of food and of clothing in, uh, in the Western region from California and Utah and Arizona. And then they partner with different shipping companies to ship those in giant containers to Bangladesh, to uh, Jordan, to Ethiopia, to other places, um, to the southern border right now. They just started doing that recently. Um, and so that was kind of that's kind of one of the things they do. Another thing they do is they run a, or they help run a refugee camp in Greece of Syrian and Iraqi refugees. That is actually how they initially started. Um, so this nonprofit um, back in 2015, um, a friend of mine who studied Arabic with me back when I was an undergrad studying Arabic, um, she was watching the news with all of the, the refugee crisis that was going on in the Mediterranean and decided to fly out to Greece to help um, with refugees. Um, and with the idea that by her helping with refugees, she would improve refugee outcomes. And so that was the very, very initial seed of an idea um, for a social program. Eventually that transformed into her helping run a refugee camp um, and being in charge of kind of the social services aspect of the refugee camp. Um, and so the organization now runs several buildings in a refugee camp in Ceres, Greece, um, where they hold um, kind of, they have a women's 
a space. Um, they have weekly parties. They have food distribution. They have English lessons, they have German lessons, they have Greek lessons, they do all sorts of kind of social programming. Um, but that all just kind of evolved um, from just being on the ground and seeing what the greatest need was and then kind of moving to that greatest need. The whole idea of doing this nonprofit was by doing some sort of activity, we can improve refugee lives. Um, but that, that was all the theory was. And so over time, that kept evolving. It wasn't ever formally articulated. It wasn't ever formally studied. It just kind of evolved. Um, but as it became more formal, then they were able to start tailoring their programs to meet um, refugee needs and start tailoring, it, tailoring their activities to actually lead to the outcomes that they intended and that the, that the recipients of, of those outcomes wanted. Um, so, for instance, one of the main focuses of the organization a few years ago was holding weekly parties for the refugees um, to just help with socialization and then helping distribute baby food and diapers and other um, um, supplies for little kids. And so that was kind of the focus of the organization. Um, but then they decided, they got a new executive director and decided to start dabbling in program evaluation. Um, they did a survey of different needs in the camp. And to their surprise, um, if you look at the survey results here, they asked um, respondents what their most important um, food or supply distribution item was. And they were assuming it was going to be diapers because that's what they had been doing over and over and over again. Um, but if you look at this chart here, the most often selected um, item um, for the least important item right here, this yellow bar, was diapers. Respondents were saying the most important thing that they could get from the nonprofit was dry food and then soap. Um, diapers was least important, which was surprising to the organization. They were thinking if we help with baby supplies, that will help with refugee um, needs, and that was their that was their implicit theory. But once they started studying this, they realized that's not actually helping, and so they started retooling and doing more of this dry food distribution and hygiene redis or distribution rather than just baby supplies. Um, similarly, they had all sorts of activities in the camp, um, different English classes, um, they had the weekly parties and stuff, and so they asked um, the recipients of these programs what was most important for them. And to their surprise, the most important activity in the camp was food distribution followed by language classes um, and hygiene distribution, which matches kind of the distribution preferences up here. The least important thing um, was the weekly parties that they were having. And so even though it was fun for volunteers to do that, um, they were able to start focusing more on helping with clothing and language classes and hygiene um, because they were able to adjust their theory that they had of let's do some social service provision to help with refugee outcomes. Um, and so over time, that kept evolving and evolving. Now it's an explicitly written down impact theory that they have saying by doing these activities and these programs, it will lead to... Um, better refugee integration in Europe, um, better ability to find jobs in Germany or in Greece or in other places in Europe, um, better safety, better health in the camp. Um, and so they have a very articulated system now. Um, it didn't start out that way, and that's fine, but it's kind of evolved to that point, um, all because of this focus on impact theory. So the moral of the story here is that the whole idea of drawing out an impact theory is that you want to make sure this arrow is good. Um, you want to make sure that your activities, your programs, all of the stuff that you're doing is actually going to lead to the outcomes you care about. And so that is where the theory lies. Um, you need to study that. Is it really going to cause um, 21st century jobs if kids can access a dinky computer that will fall apart if you drop it? Um, that arrow right there is very tenuous. Um, so that is where the focus should be when you're thinking about impact theories specifically.